I want to dig into a little bit on on the funding of the initial startup of your business. Was was that funds that you guys um, invested, uh, or was it they invested into you as a company, Taylor? Yeah, the latter, the latter. Okay. So it was investing into us as a company, into the launch of the business on the front end. So yeah, not capital like the folks that we work with now are folks that are wealthy and don't know what to do from an investment standpoint to create the portfolio they need. That's not what our teammates and, and, and former folks did. Uh, they literally funded the back end of the business. Okay, very cool. Yeah, that is cool. So um, you kind of explained it to me in our conversations, Taylor, that you feel like you got like the back end of, uh, of Wall Street, the going and analyzing everything and seeing what people with $100 million, what they do and were able to construct and like kind of like, um, you know, make their portfolios as risk diverse and as, you know, however they wanted, however they wanted to be. And you take a lot of those strategies and you bring them down to people with 10,000, 20,000, $150,000. So do you want to talk about a little bit of the similarities you've seen and some of the, the advantages of being behind in these boardrooms with these ultra net worth individuals and how you're able to kind of cascade that down to the, the modern day people? Like you always talk, you grew up in a one red light town kind of people. Yep. Yeah. So when you rewind back to where I started on Wall Street, I worked at what are the big asset managers. So like my brother worked for BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world. I worked for a company called Leg Mason, Lord Abbott, Franklin Templeton. All of them manage upwards of $750 billion. And so half our days there were spent with the folks that are building out mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera and deploying billions of dollars of capital and seeing why they're buying $500 million in mortgage-backed securities on a particular day and seeing the portfolio construction process. And then on the other end was when we were going out and working with high net worth individuals. And so we've constructed portfolios that are, you know, a million dollars. And then we've constructed portfolios that are literally, the largest one I worked on was an endowment in the state of Kentucky. $468 468 million dollars mm. and so the reality is when you look at things beneath the surface yes someone's risks might be a little different but at the end of the day portfolios all have the underlying same portfolio construction at the core of it and then from there whether someone wants to be more risk averse or more aggressive in their nature then it gets tweaked along the way but the foundation the fundamentals of all portfolios are really similar mm. that's super cool is there a particular percent allocation on certain types of securities and whatnot that that you would recommend setting up? Yeah, good question. So that's going to depend on someone's underlying need. So let's yeah. let's take a step back here. I'll, I'll kind of give you guys the foundation See, of Taylor, portfolio. Taylor, Luke asked Luke asked a lot smarter questions than I asked. You weren't prepared for those, were you? Uh, well, I'm about to I'm about to take that as a hanging curveball right now, Sam. That's an yeah, easy one. Smash for me. it. <laughs> so think about this. Like everyone knows what stocks are. So stocks are you're going out and buying a piece of a company. Now, when you buy stocks individually or buy the S&P 500, doesn't matter. What's the big risk to owning stocks? The big risk to owning stocks is a recession at the end of the day. So in a recession, you're going to have the economy contract, corporate earnings could contract, and stock prices will come down. And again, no one really knows when the next recession is going to hit. But when you own a stock-based portfolio, that's the risk that you have to offset. So how do you go ahead and do that? Well, let's take one more step back and think about things from an economic mentality and say, if we enter a recession, the Federal Reserve, what do they do with interest rates? They cut them. And what they want is mortgage rates to go from 7% down to 3%, which stimulates people to go out and spend money in the economy. Now, conversely, let's talk about bonds now. So if we're thinking about in a recession, the Fed will cut interest rates as stock prices come down. Bonds have an inverse relationship with interest rates. So as interest rates get cut, it forces bond prices higher. Beautiful. There's your offset to stock market risk is owning a percentage of your assets in bonds. Now, a lot of people come to us and they say, hey, I own cash. There's my buffer for stock market risk. All right, cool. So think about this. As the stock market recedes in a recession, what does cash do? Nothing. Stays flat. In fact, it goes down in value a little bit. It doesn't technically, if you have $100 in a bank account, it'll retain that $100 stature. But what is the yield going to do as the Fed re-racks rates lower? Yeah. Your savings account starts to pay less. So stocks don't, or I'm sorry, cash really doesn't buffer stock market risk. So bonds really do. And so there's your offset. So the last thing I'll say now is, okay, when you have stocks, you have bonds, 
is an underlying economic backdrop where they both get beaten up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is yes, that just happened in 2022. In 2022, inflation ripped, the Federal Reserve yanked interest rates higher, stocks got smoked, the S&P was down 18, the NASDAQ was down 32, bonds had their literal worst year ever. They were down 13%. So you're like, oh shit, now I have stocks and bonds getting smoked at the same time. What do I own that's gonna help my portfolio? This is where you guys come into the equation. Things like real estate. Yeah. Real estate, Boom. hard, tangible assets go up in value when you have an experience where there's a massive inflationary pressure. So you invest in things like real estate, farmland, oil, gold, timber force, critical infrastructure. And those are the three components of a portfolio that help you protect against any piece of the economic scenario that can play out because no one has a crystal ball. When's the next recession coming? Bloomberg wrote an article 16 months ago. They surveyed 112 professional economists. 112 of them said we'll be in a recession in the next 12 months. We're not. They're all yeah. wrong. And, and, uh, re and a recession, and this is uh, how smart I am, recessions, <laughs> One of those things you you don't know until you're already in them. You know what I'm saying, mm. right? Yeah. See, I learned that from Taylor. You didn't know that, Lucas, did you? I think you've said that same thing like five days in a row. <laughs> yeah, I, that's fine. <laughs> you know it. I know so it. Might see, as well share it. And I'm still not that confident when Leveraging I say it. Leverage knowledge. Yeah, yeah, leverage knowledge. I'm still not even confident when I say it. I still kind of like, is See, that where right? Where did you hear this? You caught on to it. Wherever you. Heard I heard it from him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. Um, awesome. So yeah, so having having a mixture and having yeah, a diversified that. portfolio is um, the right route for pretty much anybody. And, um, you know, you talked a little bit about before about isn't there like a maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, but like a 70 30 isn't there like a traditional like uh, split between the two between bonds and stocks? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 70 30 60 40 is the one that everyone talks about all the time. 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And uh, if you look at social media, man, 60-40 is like, hey, any idiot, 60-40, you're good. 60-40 got torched in 2022, both yeah. sides of it. Worst year ever for a 60-40. Yeah. I don't think it's the worst year ever. I think there was one year in history that was worse, but it was damn near the worst year ever. So on the hard asset side of things, like maybe someone that's not um, experts in, in real estate like Sam and I, how are these people investing in real estate that you've seen that are maybe not experts in it? Yeah, so there are different vehicles that you can utilize to invest in real estate. Um, obviously, there are publicly traded REITs, which are the real estate stocks. And then there's also bonds that you can invest in on the real estate, commercial mortgage-backed securities, et cetera. Um, there's different people with different risk tolerances are uh, more predisposed to owning one of those versus the other. And in fact, in our portfolios, we don't own publicly traded REITs. We own a different version of it and in a different format that's a little bit less liquid. Um, so, so like, I'll give you a little bit more as opposed to beating around the bush. So where we buy real estate, we buy it in a fund that's called an interval fund. An interval fund has quarterly liquidity. So when you put your money into it, you can only access the money once a quarter. So think about the other side of this. If you buy an ETF that's publicly traded REITs, yeah. guess what happens? The ETF can be sold any day of the week. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the manager is sitting there with these, you know, properties essentially saying, oh, boy, the ETF flows just went out the door. Now I have to fire sale this stuff back onto the market. And hopefully there's people like you two, Lucas and Sam, that are sitting there going, hey, I'll buy that from you. Yeah. Um, no, but in all reality, when you're buying a less liquid asset, you actually want to limit your own liquidity in the portfolio. So the manager knows how much money they have to deploy. And there's never that fire sale type opportunity. That makes sense. I like it. See, I some of that stuff I taught Taylor. But anyways, um, <laughs> so let's get into uh, let's get into um, one of your favorite asset classes, Taylor. Um, uh, cryptocurrency. Um, so uh, uh, what just happened recently? We, we, we witnessed it live here on uh, recently with a Bitcoin. So we were, you know, hanging out. With, I think it was Wednesday, maybe or, or I think it was Wednesday, right? Probably. Uh no, I think it was earlier in the week, no? Tuesday or Wednesday. But yeah. anyways, this one, Bitcoin, you know, shot. 
Yeah, yeah. it shot from like 58 to 64,000, like literally in like a 45 minutes, and it was just going like straight up. And then, uh, you know, it was like 63,000, and I was looking at my portfolio because I own a, a few Bitcoin, and I was like, holy crap, it's going like crazy. And we were like joking, should I sell? I'm like, no, I'm not going to try and day trade. I'm just going to ride this out to zero or, 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 or a big number. And then Luke was in a meeting. He texted me, Bitcoin's at 64,000 now. I was like, holy shit. So I went to my um, Coinbase app, and it showed zero dollars, and it showed um, that you know the the app is having issues right now. You can't access your funds yeah. to sell or trade. And I looked, and Bitcoin had like dropped down to like fifty eight thousand. I was like, holy crap! So what happened was they call it rugged. I got rugged. I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of whales started buying up, buy, you know, buying it and driving the price up. Then all the public got in, and then all the whales sold at one time. It shot down, and in order to avoid a complete collapse. Coinbase and other platforms just stopped people from being able to even yeah. access their funds, and then it bottomed out and then went back up. But anyways, it was quite the ride. It's back up to where kind of where it was. But anyways, I was like, wow, that is looks so illegal and so manipulative. But <laughs> it's not. It's just like the GameStop thing, except it's not you know regulated, so you can do it. So anyways, yeah. that was what I saw from my end actually living it. What did you make of that, Taylor? Well, have have y'all seen? Uh, dumb oh, money. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so good. No one. So actually doesn't it got just like bring from that. so many bells here? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. <laughs> but this one is this one is I guess no one really got in trouble there. But this one is um this one is it's not regulated. So like this kind of stuff happens. Like but anyways. But I don't think anybody ended up going to like prison for uh, um the uh, the GameStop st scam. Is that is that correct, Taylor? I would imagine that's true because I, I don't think one. I don't know anything more than you do from watching yeah. the movie. That's right. my extent of my knowledge there, and I don't recall anyone being, you know, put in prison after that. Right, I agree. So yeah, what's your thoughts on the the what happened with Bitcoin this week and then uh, stopping trading and trading in some of the platforms? Yeah, it's, so I literally have no more information on Bitcoin than you guys do. So I get questions from my buddies like, "Hey, what do you think about Bitcoin?" I'm like. I, I don't know. Toss a coin. I, that you, you, my my information and knowledge base is going to be about as good as tossing a coin. Um, when it comes to Bitcoin, it's like, you know, when it comes to a company, you can look at the underlying fundamentals, or a property, you guys can look at the underlying fundamentals and understand the cash flows, etc. When it comes to Bitcoin, at this point, there's there's nothing to actually tangibly put your hands on to understand what the value of it is. So I'm not also naive to the to the point that like. Sometimes people in the U.S. and, you know, big developed countries look at this and like, this is crazy. But I think you also have to look at it from the other perspective of like, and I don't want to be stereotypical and say sub-Saharan Africa, but that's what I'll say because you get the point of what I'm saying. In sub-Saharan Africa, if you're not confident in your own banking system, it's like, hey, why are we going to put our money here if we don't know it's going to be there? Whereas we can hold our value in Bitcoin and that being an underlying true fundamental need for them. So I think there are some needs out there in the Bitcoin world. I think in the developed nations, we haven't really seen what that tangible use case is. But I don't know. It's it's one of those things that institutions just got in. And so that could absolutely be a tailwind that could propel it and continue it higher. It's but but there's no downside gap measure on that where, you know, if if it starts to crumble, there's nothing underneath it. Hey, if this business crumbles, they own all of these assets. They at least have that tangible value. There's nothing there on Bitcoin. But also, you don't have the m upside momentum that you can catch, like like in other companies, like you can in Bitcoin. So it's a it's a coin toss. I, you can tell based on me waffling around this answer that I have no more information than you guys do on Bitcoin. No, I get it. I and and a lot of this opinion, and we've talked about it. I think you've kind of mentioned to me that. You know, if somebody's got enough money and they don't mind it going to zero potentially uh, to throw a little bit in there, obviously don't have that be your retirement fund, don't have that be just as one of those potential upside things, which is what I've done. And it's stacked into a decent amount of money, but it's I don't like I'm not like. Honestly, I would like if it goes up to enough, maybe I'll like buy a beach house with cash or something like yeah. that's all. I'm not doing it for like anything to like retire or send my kids to college or anything. So it's it's, it's fun. I think that I think it's going to continue to go up and down, up and down and go up way higher than than um, than it has uh, in the past and continue to be a, a decent investment. But, yeah, it's always got that risk of, of going to zero and being manipulated. So I don't like tell anybody to invest their like savings <laughs> in it, but uh, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to shoot you guys. I got an awesome text from my buddy of a YouTube video that's two minutes long. It's the Ford versus Ferrari movie. And it's like they're overlaying Bitcoin bro stuff on it. And so like at one point, Matt Damon steps to the edge of the edge of the track and he's talking to his guy in the Ford car and he's got a sign up. And I don't know what the sign says in the actual movie, but it says, 
institutions are in, dude. And all of a sudden you see him shift gears and just start like yeah. <laughs> around all the yeah. cars. I just I was literally laughing out loud when I watched it. Speaking of institutions they're in, one of the headlines this week is Bitcoin ETFs hit record volume as single day high of 612 million pours into BlackRock. So on Thursday, BlackRock received a record 612 million um, in Bitcoin ETF and crossed 10 billion in assets under management. A day after the asset class hit a high of 7.7 billion in trading volume. Um, volumes reached 4.7 billion yesterday as the frenzy continues to track investors. So yeah, let's we'll talk a little. So you can speak on the ETF side a little bit more than you know just general Bitcoin. So what are your thoughts on all that? Because Taylor, we've had some chats before. It was one of those things where this was looking to get approved, and it was one of those old you know you you, you buy the rumor, sell the news. Like it went up, and as soon as as soon as it like officially was approved, which everyone knew it was everything it, it dropped pretty substantially so that was one of those sayings that uh, i learned from taylor as well you buy the rumor you sell the news that's an old wall street adage yeah um no it's interesting so one of the things that maybe the end public doesn't really know at this point is also these things haven't been turned on yet at the wirehouses and the wirehouses are so merrill lynch morgan stanley wells fargo ubs those are considered wirehouse firms the biggies they are not able, their financial advisors are not able yet to purchase them in their client accounts. So that's another like big thing that people are weighing on to say, hey, when the wirehouses start piling in, man, you could see these ETFs ramp mm -hmm. higher, buying more and more Bitcoin and sending it higher. Um, yeah. and, and again, this might be one of those things that's buy the rumor, sell the news too. Like a lot of the smart money in the Bitcoin space knows that's going to be the case um, and are pricing accordingly. But nonetheless, you should see... Um, an influx of, of buying on those ETFs based on that. Um, can you explain, um, and you do this to me a while ago, so I understand it. Can you explain kind of the public um, what like an ETF is and how like Bitcoin's this whole thing on Coinbase and all these Robinhood, all these other like platforms, and now it's an ETF through like, you know, bigger firms. So can you kind of explain how that process works that Bitcoin it has became an ETF and kind of what ETFs are? Yeah, so ETF is not, or, you know, Bitcoin is not a traditional ETF. Essentially, I, I'm not going to do this justice, but an ETF is just is simply a way to access something so you're not going out and buying it on cold storage and things like that, or going through some knockoff, you know, exchange firm that is, I don't know, so Coinbase isn't knockoff at this point, but you get the point of that. Um, what this does is leaves it readily available on the New York Stock Exchange. So anyone that owns any type of trading account, whether it's Schwab, Vanguard, whether it's at these big firms, they all can access it without opening a separate Coinbase type account to go ahead and buy it in that direction. So it just provides a higher level of accessibility. Okay, and then the Bitcoin just got approved through the SEC to be an ETF. So I guess that's just a process of the SEC looking at the fund, like how, how does that, because not everything can get approved to be an ETF, correct? Yeah. Next time we're going to talk all about Bitcoin, give me some context so I can do a little work on we're this almost before just coming on. Last and last one, last one. We don't know anything about Bitcoin either. So you could literally <laughs> just make something up and we would not know. And still, your thoughts on Bitcoin compared to like the general population is probably, you know, much more well thought out. So uh, we appreciate whatever, whatever uh, angle you could give us here. Yeah, yeah. So reiterate that last question to me real quick here. Um, so just in general, I just don't even know the process of like Bitcoin being approved as an ETF. I don't even know what that statement oh, gotcha. means. That yeah. or that. Yeah. Yeah. So normally when you launch an ETF, what it does is goes through SEC regulation. And so what they do is they have every ETF has a board of directors that looks at the underlying risks of the holdings, et cetera, and says, OK, this is sufficient risk metrics these has the bright bells and whistles on it to defend the underlying clients that buy it. I don't know that that's all that pertinent to Bitcoin. The big difference in Bitcoin and what the new ETF versus the old ETF is that the old ETF was not the spot price. So literally right now, the exact price of Bitcoin is accessible in an ETF. Now, my huge underlying question is, does that really make that big of a difference than what the past ETF accessibility was where it was buying Bitcoin, you know, not, not at spot price. And I don't know, it's still access to, to Bitcoin. It's just this is a little bit more of an efficient vehicle and giving you specifically what today's price is 
the other did a good job of that admittedly but it may have been fractionally off mm -hmm. on how much it went up if bitcoin went up five percent maybe it went up 4.95 percent or something really close with the volatility and the magnitude of move in bitcoin I don't know that that minute differential is that big of a difference, but this is a momentum. This is a rumor based asset because there's no underlying fundamentals to it. So if the rumor mill starts picking up, Reddit starts picking up, all these folks start getting involved. Now the institutions are involved too. Listen, smart money, big time money. They get FOMO too. They got FOMO yeah. right now and they're propelling this thing higher. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. So we can we can stop with yeah. The let's stop to Bitcoin, but let's uh, yeah. Uh, other side of financial markets. Let's just talk about the stock market in general here, Taylor. What you know, S and P is up about five percent in the past week. Uh, S and P five hundred about almost eight percent year to date, and in the last year, the S and P is up thirty percent. Tell us, Ooh. tell us what is going on with the stock market right now, and. You know, is this just uh, this this pie in the sky thing that's going to all come crashing down or is this uh, going to continue throughout the year in your in your opinion? Yeah, it's a good question. And again, I'll, I'll resort to the fact that I don't have a crystal ball, but I'll give you some explanations and some thoughts from my end. So last year, you kind of hit this environment that I'll refer to as like Goldilocks from an economic standpoint. So you had inflation continuing to drift downwards. And you had economic growth that outperformed meaningfully what the market expectations were. And so therefore, companies, profits, balance sheets, et cetera, really benefited. And you had the S&P 500 for the year of 2023 up 25%. Now, granted, it was on the backs of a year where it was down almost 19%. So it had some catching up to do from what it had lost. Um, but at the end of the day, it was something that not many folks were anticipating. And again, that Goldilocks scenario is what played out last year. Inflation down, economic growth positive, that's really good for stocks. Now, just for context, the stock market is expensive right now. And that's not my opinion, that's looking at the data. So the way you measure how inexpensive or expensive stocks are is a, is a, a metric. There's lots of them to look at, but the main one that people look at is called a price to earnings ratio. So it looks at the S&P 500 and it says for every dollar that companies in the S&P 500 produce on earnings, how much is the market paying for that dollar worth of earnings? So historically for context, it's right around 15 or $16 for every $1 worth of earnings. Right now it trades at 20.4, $20.40 for every $1 worth of earnings. And for context, that puts us in about the top 10 percentile most expensive stocks get throughout history. Now valuation is awesome because it gives you a really good idea. Apples to apples are stocks more expensive than they were in 1929 and 1958, 1932, whatever. So it's a great way to look at things on an apples to apples basis. And when things get expensive like stocks are now, there is a tendency for them to revert back to the mean. That being said, it is a terrible timing mechanism. It's not to say things are gonna revert back to the mean right now. In 1999, when we had this euphoric dot-com bubble that was building and building and building, the Federal Reserve Chairman, a guy named Paul Volcker, I'm sorry, Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan said in 1996, a famous quote, the market is irrationally exuberant. That was in 1996. And the price to earnings multiple is similar to where it is right now at 20-ish times earnings. It went to almost 40 times earnings in 1999. So he said three years before that people are crazy and it continued to get more and more crazy. The market went on a moonshot for the next three years as people were crazy, but people made a lot of money and then in 2000, 2001, 2002, the market melted for three straight years and the dot-com bubble burst. And so again, it's not to say that valuations are, hey, if, if stocks are expensive right now, that all of a sudden the house of cards is gonna come crashing down, but you do need to start thinking about in the future, returns being more muted based on expensive stocks. And I'll give you one more set of statistics and I know I'm rambling right now. Historically, the S&P 500 does 10-ish percent a year over the long term. When stocks are priced at 20 times earnings, where they are right now, over the next five years, at that given starting point, the S&P 500 has produced about a 4% per return per year. So that kind of tells you going forward in the future right now, stock returns should be thought to be more muted than they have in that 10% average number that everyone throws around. Nope. Yeah, would you, would you think that is from like a, uh, another 
bull run of a couple years after that 20 times earnings and then followed by uh, a, a decline in, in prices and that kind of averages to that four, you think? Or is it just like kind of muted along the way? It's, it's a good question. No one really knows the answer to that. But the stock market doesn't work in linear fashion. So it's not like, hey, the next five years, it's going to 4%. It's going to be 4%, yeah. 4%, 4%, 4%. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. In all likelihood, what you'll have is the stock market do well or not do well. And at some point, you probably get a meaningful dra- da- drawdown. And then it hits you know more normal numbers on a forward moving basis. And on the average, it's 4%. So there's a great line. There's a great writer in the financial space called Morgan Housel, named, he's not called, that's his name, Morgan <laughs> Housel. Morgan Housel breaks things down into like really tangible bites. He's got a great book called The Psychology of Money and then a second book called Something's Never Changed. No, I'm not promoting this, I don't even know Morgan, but it's just really good writing. And he recently was on a podcast and I heard him say this, smart investing is preparation through investing, not prediction. And his point to that is like, if you look at the last three major market meltdowns we've seen, the last one was COVID. Who could predict that? The one before that was 2008. I a little bit disagree with this one, but in 2008, he said, listen, if Bear Stearns could have bought Lehman Brothers, which the regulators didn't allow to happen, that meltdown would not have been the same as what we experienced. And the regulators said no, stupidly. And the one before that was 2001 when a plane, you know, planes hit the Twin Towers. Those are things you can't predict. So don't predict how you invest, prepare, because what's gonna happen that's gonna drive the market up, down, or sideways are things that you can't foresee. Yeah, so you you would not consider what happened in 2002, I'm sorry, 2022, to be a major meltdown. It, to me, it looked like it was on the tech side, especially where we saw like 50, 60% 50, declines in some of these large tech stocks. And how, is was that relatable at all to what happened in the early 2000s? Because we, you know, we were in middle school at that time, so we didn't know what the heck was going on. So um, I still don't know tax going on. Guys, yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hope hopefully that rounds out that question for you, Taylor. <laughs> I just can't get over the glasses. <laughs> My future's bright. Um, um, yeah. So back to your question of like 2022. I think 2022 was largely a function of 2020 and what happened to COVID. Okay. So what happened with COVID was, you know, the coffers were opened. Everyone got stimulus checks. Interest rates were cut down to nothing. They were held at zero for a really long period of time. And then you had kind of another unforeseen Russia invade the Ukraine, yep. causing inflation to spike seemingly overnight. Right. And inflation was building a little bit via the COVID stimulus and fiscal stimulus that came along with it and monetary. And so that was already building in that direction. And then when Russia invaded Ukraine, another completely unknown, unpredictable, boom, inflation takes off. And that's what caused the meltdown in 2022. And the other thing that caused the meltdown in 2022 was the euphoric run that happened post COVID in 2020 and 2021. This was the last time Bitcoin was where it is right now. Yeah. Right. So, and I'm not, I'm not portending what's going to happen in the future here of a, of a meltdown in, in Bitcoin, like it, like it experienced back then. But this is when people start sending you text messages about things, Hey, you know, Steph's getting hot. He's bombing threes. Yeah. Like start to pay attention, like start to at least red, raise red flags. I'm not saying go and blow out of everything. It's Hey, protect things. Yeah. And you do that. There's ways to do that in the investment universe that people need to be aware of. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the real estate world when everybody and their brother wants to flip a house and they think it's cool, then that's usually the time that we're like, wait a second, something's going on here. <laughs> exactly. All right. So so two things. One, Taylor, every time Luke's asks a question, you say good question. Every time I ask a question, you laugh. You're a moron. I don't know what that's about, <laughs> but look, let me give you both my theory um, and you guys can rip it apart on why um, – why the, the, the general economy and stock market, and maybe it's a theory that's out there, I'm sure it is. Um, but is it, could it be, there's other factors, but could it be almost as simple as there was 80% of the history of the US dollar was dumped into the US economy in a very short period of time, 80% of the history of the dollar that's ever been printed. They just printed so much money through stimulus, through PPP, through um, all of these things that that money has to go somewhere. It just it, The fact that there was so much of it there, some of it is going to bleed over to the stock market. Some of it is going to bleed over to other investments that are going to not artificially push it because it's real money going in there. But there, you, you see what I'm trying to say is that part of it, the the fact that just so much money got dumped into the pot, it's going to bleed out into other things and make investments look good. Is, do you think there's some of that into it? 
No doubt. Yeah, there's what a, a good statistic. question by Sam. That's all I'm going to say. Good. Yeah, good, good. question. <laughs> You're right. I have said that every time. That is su- totally subconscious. That's just because I keep looking at you wearing those glasses and going, what is going on here? I don't blame you at all. <laughs> so there's a statistic. Good question. Uh, there is a statistic that you can stare at called M2, which looks at money supply, how much money is being put in circulation. And there is a really good overlap between M2, how much money is being spilled into the market, and asset returns. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at real estate, whether you're looking at stocks, any asset, there is a heavy correlation between the two. And now what we're seeing a little bit is just, and again, I'm not trying to create this scary scenario, is M2 is slowing down. M2 has gone negative. And so that comes with, listen, banks aren't lending as much anymore. And when banks aren't willing to lend and fictitiously create money, and I don't mean that in a bad way, that's what they're doing, is they're going out and creating money for folks to go out and spend in the economy. Right now, banks have tightened the old strap. And so they're not as willing to lend and things like that. The Federal Reserve went from putting money into the economy to sucking money out of the economy with raising rates and also with their quantitative easing, now quantitative tightening process. And so all of those things you know, took liquidity, to your point, out of the market. And to your point, there is a very heavy correlation between asset prices and liquidity. If you were to invest based on one thing, Sam, that would not be a dumb approach. Nice. All right. I like Good it. Work. Good for me. Um, yeah, proud of you. Yeah, so I, I took piggyback off that a little bit, Taylor. Banks are tightening the strings a little bit, but also the interest rates are making it less appetizing to borrow money. Like Lucas and I, if um, and it's a good thing because of kind of what we're just how quickly we grew. We're we're dealing with some. That's a whole nother episode of all the growing pains we're dealing with for buying twenty five million dollars in real estate in thirteen months and how how much we're dealing with the fallout of that. But um, in general, uh, it's like harder. Like we don't b- borrow as much money because the deals don't make as much sense. We're not buying apartment complexes. We're not buying as many as many big assets because it costs us eight percent as a, it used to cost us four percent and it won't cash flow anymore so there's the bank tightening but also the the investor tightening of hey deals don't make sense when money costs this much so there's that side yeah. of it as well yeah i mean that's 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 half the half the reason behind why houses aren't turning over these days because people can't yeah. afford to do it you guys know this space better than i do the one thing i'm interested in seeing is and you guys can uh you know pontificate on this as well if you have any thoughts is Historically, when you look at um, mortgage rates, they're set off of where the 10-year treasury bond is. So the 10-year treasury bond right now yields 420. There you go for your glasses, 420. Um, It's about where where, uh, the 10-year treasury is. And usually there's 130 130 to 160 basis point spread, which would put, you know, uh, a percent and a half on ha- on 420. So you're at 570. You guys know mortgage rates are significantly above that right now. And I'm talking about residential here, not on yeah. investment real estate like you guys are purchasing. So that would say if 10 year is here, that the average 30 year mortgage that an individual buying a home for a primary residence would be, would be right around 575, somewhere in that ballpark. Right, right. now it's meaningfully above that. And one of the reasons that's taking place is because Banks are trying to measure their risk. Lending institutions are trying to measure their risk. And with interest rates having been so darn volatile because inflation's been so darn volatile, what they need to do is build in a bigger layer of safety there. And they're not going to take that risk on their book. They're going to push that through in pricing. And there's a wider spread than historically normal. And so as interest rates settle in and as inflation, we get a better beat on where it's going to be in the future. You should see some compression there, I hope. And I hope to see mortgage rates come down for folks. And you guys would obviously love that as well, right? Yeah, that would open up the floodgates a little bit. I think Lucas talks about this. In, In 2023, there was less real estate transactions than in 08 that tells you how suppressed the market was and the market wasn't turning over as far as just a transactional basics. So that that tells you how 2023, the pricing, um, you know, has, has been pretty good for most markets. But as far as on a how many houses were sold basis, it was it was less than 08, which is pretty crazy to think about because interest rates are higher and, you know, people don't want to leave their 4 percent, 3 percent interest rates. For sure. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead Taylor. Go ahead, Taylor. Yeah, I have a buddy who says, listen, there was a, there was a recession or a depression 
in real estate. You just didn't realize it. It wasn't in the price of homes. It was in the transactions. Absolutely. A and 100%. a company like ours, which is highly transaction focused, uh, you know, we definitely felt it last year, no doubt. Yeah, we went from 312 houses uh, in 2022 uh, to last year 170. Yeah, that's 170. So, I mean, still a lot of houses, but, man, that's, you know, that's a... 40% drop in transactions. Yeah. Fortunately, our price, our profit per deal was double what it was, yes. but still it's just a, a big, a big, a big drawback on transactions for sure. For sure. That, that spread that you talked about, Taylor, that's something we watch, you know, on a, on a daily basis, probably, 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 and our, our thought, thought process is very, very similar to yours is uh, we're hoping that margin compress as interest rates from the, the federal government haven't, or sorry, from, um, uh, the the ten year haven't haven't uh, I'm sorry where am I going with this uh, hopefully that spread goes down yes. here as as interest rates kind of stabilize right uh, so they don't even have to drop you just have exactly. to not they just have to not predict a future they just have to have a better feeling of where they're potentially going you know they're not going to go up anymore they might not go down but as long as they're going to stay For where sure. they are we can compress our spread a little bit and, and take the risk out and, and do more deals because they're not going to do as and many we, deals we, until they compress it and we haven't had a raise since July yeah I think, I so. think of 23 and we just got quality core inflation data this week we just got good quote unquote um uh job reports this week so um just just talking to you taylor here and obviously i would love your thoughts sam love I'm ready your thoughts. lucas um you know what what do you think the uh what do you think this looks like for um you know maybe maybe what the federal government is going to do with with interest rates uh uh, as as we're seeing quality inflation reports come, are they going to try to get ahead of it and start start rate cuts sooner rather than later? Uh, especially with like what we're seeing in Bitcoin and these hot financial markets on top of that. Yeah, I've Don't been in say the camp. Good question. All right, good, you didn't. Okay, good sorry. question. No, that's an amazing question. Oh, shut amazing up. Amazing question. Um, yeah, I, I've been in the camp for a long time now that we aren't going to get as many cuts this year as what the market anticipated. Um, so the market was saying, you know, three months ago that we were going to get six to seven interest rate cuts this year. And I'm looking at it going, listen, they're still talking about scares of inflation and potentially rates going higher. So I thought that that was crazy. Um, but on the other end, one of the things that's a huge component, and I'm interested to hear your guys' firsthand experience with this. One of the things that's a huge input component, the largest by far, is owner equivalent rent to all the inflation metrics. And it keeps going higher. And then when you look at some of the other indicators of this, like Redfin and Zillow put out their information on rents, and they're actually seeing rents come down a little bit and have now for the past five, six months, but it hasn't bled through to what the Fed measures with this owner equivalent rent. And so a lot of the forecasters are saying that, listen, this is coming through the system. That housing or shelter component of it is going to leak down. It hasn't done so yet. And if it does, that's going to bring the inflation metrics that the Fed looks at very closely down along with it. So um, if that's the case and that starts to play out more quickly, which it hasn't yet in the data they look at, then that will give them a little bit of uh, solace to go out and then cut interest rates maybe more quickly than what they're anticipating at this point. Yeah. So Taylor and I have had this talk for a while now, you know, via our lives that everybody got a little bit uh, bullish on what they thought the rates there's there's very very uh, unlikely scenario that rates were going to be cut how people were predicting plus we had completely opposing um predictions right we had people predicting i think taylor you can quote me if i'm wrong a a 12 percent um growth in the in the con in the economy yet also six or seven price drops and th they both can't happen at the same time in order for the for the interest rates to go down that would mean you, we wouldn't have to have big earnings if we have big earnings they're not going to drop rates and, and that's what's played out so far good earnings no rate drops can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit uh, of that amazing question i just had you listen well you listen well i'm impressed um i will twist your words a little bit um and say that you're almost spot on in saying that corporate earnings were the expectations okay, to grow 12 percent and so with that again you can't measure corporate earnings being up 12 percent, or you can't write the ship and say yeah that makes sense at the same time on the other side the fed thinks they need to stimulate the economy and so what's happened is corporate earnings have been pretty darn good um and i will caveat and say that when you look beneath the surface, I think they've been not quite as good as what the market has uh, responded to. But nonetheless, um, NVIDIA, you know, that was the only one anyone cared about. I've never seen in my career 
so much focus on one company's earnings as I did on NVIDIA. And literally wow. it monumentally moved the entire market the yeah. day after earnings. Like it moved the, the market cap of NVIDIA by something like $250 billion. That's crazy. That's larger than Target. That's yeah. larger than the company of Target in one day. Yeah. And so like, it's just crazy how much yeah. it moved, but that was yeah. like the epicenter of yeah. focus. But back to your point, Sam, which was an amazing point, was you could not get 12% corporate earnings growth and also six or seven interest rate cuts. It just, the math doesn't work. Well, don't hate on our target. We own some target here at uh, Prosper Companies, but uh, um, yeah. <laughs> what I was getting at is the magnitude I, of the I move, know. the corporate, the, the, I, the addition of valuation on NVIDIA yeah surpassed the that, entire value of the company of target that that happened with meta uh a Correct. month or two ago as well Correct. it was a very similar couple billion couple hundred billion dollar jump in one day yeah it, it's nuts yeah we so we have a I, we talked a little bit taylor, taylor we have a, a certain investing company to in, invest in and in, in markets and potentially companies and things with some of the profit from our companies and one of the things we do is you yeah, invest in the markets a little bit and when target kind of stepped in it from a publicity standpoint um uh, several months ago and their price went down we went ahead and bought some so yeah we we think decisions uh, not me <laughs> my my myself and uh phil blackwood who's our uh, one of our analysts here he's he's more real estate focused but we read the intel of it intelligent investor by ben graham so you're and we you're think good we're, we think we're experts you're so, good. Yeah, we're not and like we, we're and not, we use his like stock picker that it, that book provides i mean we probably like bought five grand yeah. of, of of target stock when it was down right or more uh, maybe I 10 i don't know where my money goes but anyways um i trust lucas so we're all good so yeah um so that so yeah so that is just interesting and a lot of it's um played out to where there's the extremes on either side of things and and through our conversation taylor i know you're more of like yeah most likely things are in the middle as as far as the predicted um corporate earnings as well as the rate cuts it's, nobody has a, a you know a crystal ball but i don't know that i'd even predict a rate cut at the next meeting but i, I could see I one or two in march i, I, I could see in march. No. If, I, if you force me to predict i'd predict one month. or two rate that's cuts crazy. this year uh, that that's what, what would you predict luke Stein? again we know that we're just in, guessing in the, these cuts that we're talking about they're going to be so minor quarter or whatever yeah. yeah so um i could see if we keep having quality um reports come back like we had this past week uh i uh, month over month over the next two months i could see it in may being a first like quarter point half point personally but. what are you seeing taylor i mean again we know you're guessing what are you what are you guessing yeah i i think that i'm in i'm in your camp sam one to two so here's here's the interesting thing right now the market's moved from six to seven interest rate cuts to three that's what's being priced in this year that's what the expectation is and the stock market has continued to go up and so when you rewind back to last year the market started to rip in october because October 31st, I think, was when the Fed met. And the Fed said, hey, we think we're done with interest rate cut or re interest rate hikes, and we probably won't need to do any more. So the market said, oh boy, here we go, baby. Interest rate cuts coming. We'll price in six or seven of them. And that took the market up like 14% in the fourth quarter. And now the interesting thing is like, okay, fast forward, we've taken three or four of those off the table, and the market continues to do this. like." Why, why is this a one-way street where it's really good when there's more interest rate cuts starting to get jubilant in the market, but when you take them back off, doesn't matter, whatever, it's let's still keep good, rolling. Right? Yeah, that, that's what we <laughs> talked about. A lot of the fundamentals don't make sense with what's going on in the market. That's why a lot of your videos haven't been trying, you're not painting this like this, this doomsday scenario, but it's just like, hey, be observant of what's going on. This is a little bit uncharted territory. There's always, every single year is new because there are different factors, right? There, you can't ever prepare compare year over year, but like there's just some funky stuff going on and not saying it's gonna drop off of a cliff, but this is an odd time we're in right now. Things don't always make sense. Yeah, and I'll say this part too, like, Soft landing is the narrative right now, right? Soft landing is gonna play out. That's what the market's saying. It's always soft landing when you go into recession. They're always talking soft landing. That, that, and there have been very few thing. there have been very few times when we've been able to effectively navigate a soft landing. And everyone thinks it's a foregone conclusion that it'll happen this time. And it very well could. I'm not saying it's not, but nineteen ninety four is about the only time in history where you could see inflation pick up, the Fed raise interest rates to track it down and effectively not enter us into a recession. Mm. So we'll, we'll see, it certainly could play out, but uh, you know, if you're betting on history, I wouldn't bet on a soft landing per se. And it's not to say if we do go into recession, it has to be this bloodbath like it was in 2008. Like 
that was a nasty recession. It felt yeah. like the world was literally crumbling. Our financial system started to have massive question marks as to whether all of the banks that were going to go under. Wachovia got bought by Wells Fargo. It was a massive bank at the time, and yeah. it needed a bailout. Warren Buffett steps in and bails out Goldman Sachs, the institution of them all. And so it's not to say it needs to be like that, but for us to just say, hey, things are going to be steady as she goes, uh, I, I, I think that um, – there needs to be some reality in the fact that history doesn't indicate our ability to navigate these interest rate hikes without some sort of mild recession coming on the back. For sure. Yeah, I get that. And, and you know, we're, we're business owners here and we're also in real estate, but just I just know what it felt like at, you know, late 22 through mid 23 and it, and it freaking hurt you know what i mean it was it was painful so for for people to tell me that wasn't a recession is is that you're lying like that was a recession for us, for yeah, our, yeah we got kicks <laughs> we got quick kick square in the nuts we lost several hundred thousand dollars in our company or you know but in yeah. all of our companies over that period um luckily we have multiple companies but yeah it was it was bad like and if you look at just the median house price from whatever the height was to what it you know what it dipped down to it dropped like 75 yeah. grand and um you know from whatever that that and that was the biggest like price drop ever even through 08 in that period yeah. of time and i get it was on a higher number so the percentage i don't even know the math but that chart is insane yeah. after the median house price after 2020 and then a complete uh, you know what's the opposite of rip went all the way down and then it up and then it's back down again so yeah, yeah. The, the real estate uh, market and fewer transactions so i guess not everybody felt it but it right been and, and it comes hard. in different shapes and sizes depending on your industry or type of business or all that but uh we definitely felt a lot of a lot of pain uh on the back side of this when they started to raise rates yeah for, for sure that was back to your inflation comment before lucas is like as as we've seen median household or median median houses come down in price that would lead you to believe that rents have to come down a little bit too. Yeah. And that has not leaked through into that inflation data, which is what we were talking about before, which alludes to you potentially being right, where more interest rate cuts could be in the future than what's expected. Yep. Cool. I like it. All right, let's say we're going to we're going to get to uh, we got a few more minutes. Then we're going to get to some uh, ending questions and yeah. we're going to play. Would you rather which is a fun game The we have more questions for you. But the one thing I kind of want to do get into, which is interesting, is um, Thoughts on the uh, the economy over in China? I know we had talks before uh, in China. We have talks before about um, <laughs> you know that ever they they were shut down through COVID, like lock you know locked them down, and then they released everybody, and it did not. That we were wrong. Everybody predicted this huge surge, and that did not happen. They built China has built like hundreds of thousands of buildings and dwellings that nobody's occupied, um, and there's there's just a lot of issues potentially going over there their their financials do not look very good right now from what i have seen so taylor you're much more in tune in that so could you give us a little bit of your thoughts on a kind of where the chinese market has been recently how their real estate bubble is kind of fitting into that and then what that kind of means in the future in you know you're just through your potential lens yeah um good question sam um <laughs> on the on the front of of china no it's been it's been interesting because everyone expected this massive surge, the huge positive blowback from China of when they started to release their lockdown, this and that, everyone gets out and starts yeah. spending like they did here in the States. Um, that didn't play out. And so China is now experiencing something like a 2008 for us, where you had massive overbuild in real estate. And now the real estate market hit that tipping point and started to come plummeting down on the other side. And Chinese by culture, they have a tendency to own more of their wealth in real estate than in maybe investments, if you will, um, more traditional investments like the stock market, et cetera, or 401ks here in the United States. And so they're predisposed more so to a downturn in real estate prices than we are here in the States. And so when they started to hit that tipping point, real estate markets started to roll over, Evergrande and some other huge, huge, huge real estate companies started to literally go under it hit that tipping point and china is now absolutely quote you know created a blowout on the bottom side of their stock market and what's interesting from like an investment standpoint not to go too far off the rails here but china is an emerging market and so emerging markets kind of get grouped together and so the big emerging markets are the BRICS that everyone talks about brazil russia india china south africa but like india's economy is actually doing pretty darn well right now and because they're grouped as an emerging market that has this massive downward pressure based on china's economic news they're seeing a sell-off in some of their things that are unwarranted just because they're grouped into that nature 
And so there's some really good investment opportunities in mm -hmm. India. And the Indian uh, uh, stock market has actually been able to buck some of that trend and go up. But I think it would have gone up much more had it not been that downward pressure from China. And there might be some opportunity there. Yeah, and, and we talked about this a little bit. Everyone talks about the U.S. debt. China's debt to GDP percentage is, is worse even than the U.S. debt, right? I'm, I'm not was quoting that, correct? Taylor? China, yeah, China's found themselves in a debt issue as well. Um, and, and it's just a different economic mentality there. You know, large companies can be partially state-run. It can be partially private. Um, from just a business regulatory standpoint, we think it's bad here in the States. And, you know, if you want to go out and build a new building, there's so much red tape and stuff like that. If you speak out against the Chinese government, Jack Ma, the owner of Alibaba, literally disappeared for three months. And people were like, hey, he spoke out against Xi Jinping. He might be dead. No, and that's what the that's assumption crazy. was. And then he resurfaced five months later and he looked skinny as a rail. Um, so that is the difference. We might think that uh, things are onerous and and uh, we can't talk about bad things in our in our own society. It's uh, freedom of speech is a little more serious here than it is over there. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. Make sure to hit that like button, comment with something you learned, and make sure to subscribe to this channel. We give away more free advice on how to create wealth based on things we actually do every single day than any other channel on YouTube. Make sure to share this with a friend because our mission is to inspire you to think differently about freedom.